Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Frank Watto, here with my great friend and America's primary care physician, Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Paul, you ready to talk about rhinitis? <laughs> I'm excited. I feel like it's always the season to talk about rhinitis, no matter what time of year it is. Well, we had a great guest, Dr. Olajimok Fadugba from Penn. She's an allergist and immunologist. And Paul, one of her pet peeves is when people just call everything allergic rhinitis because we should be calling it chronic rhinit rhinitis if it's if it's chronic. Well, that's a big term, umbrella term, and there's many buckets underneath it that y people could fall into. So you you sort of, when you're getting the history, you got to figure out, is it perennial, meaning does it happen year-round because certain things can cause that? You know, if people have cats, Paul, believe it or not, you know, cat dander is around all year, so maybe they have sinus symptoms all year. And uh, it, dust mites were the other one, pretty hard to avoid those. So those are some perennial allergens. And then, Paul, there's this allergic versus non-allergic rhinitis, which, uh, which is something I hadn't really put too much stock into or really thought as much about. I, it didn't realize exactly how nuanced it got. You know, so there is this non-allergic rhinitis that can still be seasonal because of the changes in temperature and the changes in humidity can also still trigger the rhinitis. So it gets very granular, but it turns out it kind of matters when you actually get to what medications you use for what. Some ways you can try to figure out if it's allergic or non-allergic. She said asking if people have a lot of like itchy eyes and they're sneezing a lot, that can be that can be more of an allergic rhinitis. But both allergic and non-allergic rhinitis have the congestion, the rhinorrhea. So, you know, it's it's sort of like you can't figure it out based on just that. Um, she said some of the clues that it might be a non-allergic rhinitis are if it's later in onset. She said, um, so 30 to 40% of rhinitis is non-allergic rhinitis. And if it's somebody that never had allergies and now all of a sudden they're coming with new chronic sinus symptoms, you might think this is a non-allergic rhinitis. But it is a diagnosis of exclusion, Paul. So I guess they need allergy testing. I suppose if you want to make the definitive diagnosis, you do have to fully rule it out. Though I, I do suspect you might be able to get away with some empiric treatment if they get better. You can feel like a winner because sometimes getting yeah. built in for allergy testing can be a little bit of a challenge. The main treatment that is different between the two, the oral antihistamines do not really seem to work for non-allergic rhinitis, but they, they can help with allergic rhinitis. The Weirdly, the nasal antihistamines and the nasal steroids do seem to work for both allergic and non-allergic rhinitis. So I, I don't understand the mechanism there, Paul, but the or just if you think someone might have non-allergic, I wouldn't go with the oral antihistamines as your first line. Um, I would go with a nasal spray, and you pretty much can't go wrong with uh, one of the either an antihistamine or a, a steroid nasal spray. Typically start with the, the nasal sprays. Like I feel like that's kind of first line for almost everybody. So allergic versus non-allergic and almost, you're going to probably do an intranasal steroid to start with. And it's, we go through, it's, it's kind of dealer's choice and what the patient can tolerate and afford. And you can sometimes even get them covered by insurances. Oftentimes, at least in my experience in my geographic area. Um, I will say that this is one of the medications where I think that we as doctors, you know, see also nicotine patches and lots of other stuff where we just don't counsel patients on how to use it appropriately. So we did revisit that and this idea of head down, pointing the nasal spray towards your, your lateral, towards your ear, basically, and then spraying not, not towards your brain, and you're not horking it down, so there should be a whole <laughs> slurping sound afterwards, because if you taste it, you waste it, as the, as the allergist and immunologist say. So it's, it's supposed to sit up there and not be swallowed immediately. So I will yeah. say, if your patient is sensitive to the floral flavor of some of the fluticasones, which I don't mind so much as, as a user myself, then you can try like Mometazone or the other formulation, but they're all roughly equivalent. Speaking of medications, are there medications that might cause rhinitis? Any common ones that we use in primary care? Apparently the combined um, hormonal oral contraceptives can do it. Uh, it makes sense, but PDE5 inhibitors, so things that cause uh, vasodilation could also do it. Some of your antihypertensives, so I've seen beta blockers and ACE inhibitors listed specifically. Um, some of the medications for BPH. So there's, there's a, a couple of medications that you can think about as a potential cause, though my suspicion is they're not going to be as common as, as some of the other causes. We mentioned medication treatments. So if people are having rhinitis and let's say they're really bothered by rhinorrhea and maybe they're already on a steroid or an antihistamine, you can try nasal ipratropium uh, for people that have really prominent rhinorrhea. She said that can work well and it's usually taken uh, three or four times a day. 
So I have had good success with that personally. Um, and Well, not personally, but prescribing it for my patients. I, patients have liked that one. And then the other one that I have never prescribed, but that she that is available over the counter and that, you know, when you're reading review articles, uh, and sometimes this comes up talking about the common cold, is this intranasal chromalin. And I've never used it, but it's a mast cell stabilizer. And she said that one can actually be beneficial. Let's say I had a cat allergy and I was going to visit Paul. Well, I could use the intranasal chromalin ahead of time, and that would hopefully sort of make it so that I'm not having such bad rhinitis when I'm around Paul's lovely cats. Paul, what about Montelukast? Because I never know what to do with that one. But I've seen that sometimes prescribed as like a last-ditch attempt to kind of fix someone's chronic rhinitis. She really only ever prescribes it for patients who have these uh, rhinitis symptoms and asthma. It never just for, for rhinitis in and of itself or for chronic rhinitis um, because it doesn't work. And then also it's there have been some new warnings. There's some black box warnings from the FDA. So unless there's a really good, solid indication for it, it's not something you should just prescribe lightly. So just trying it just to see is probably not the right approach for this. But if someone has... Um, Challenging control asthma, and then also as a component of that, some challenging nasal symptoms as well. It might be a reasonable medication to try. And finally, Paul, how does climate change possibly have anything to do with rhinitis? I feel like I'm just seeing more and more of this stuff every year, and I, I don't know if I'm more sensitive to it or it's because I'm having more symptoms myself, but it turns out the prevalence actually is going up. We're just seeing more of it in part because it's just getting hotter outside, which is in turn worsening the, the allergen exposure to production of the allergens and the severity of the symptoms right along with this. So it's not just you. Um, more, more people are having more severe disease because the world is changing, um, because of stuff that we do. So fix that, but then also just be, just be mindful and expect to see even more of these as you move forward in your careers. Well, she gave us so many great tips. Uh, we asked her all the questions we could think of as primary care physicians who see a lot of patients with rhinitis, chronic rhinitis. So if you would like to hear the full episode, click on the link in the transcript, transcript below. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> Until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Wado, and this has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Indeedly doodly, Matt. And I remain Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. <laughs> Thank you, and goodbye.